So last week I discussed recurrent neural networks. This week we will discuss distributional lexical semantics. And one of the lexical semantic models is latent semantic analysis. LSA was introduced for information retrieval, but has been used for a variety of applications in cognitive science and computational linguistics. It's relatively simple. It's a statistical model. A large corpus of text gets transformed into a matrix of terms and documents. Matrix algebra then breaks down the sparse matrix into smaller and concise matrices using singular value decomposition. One of those smaller matrices can be used to compute the cosine distance between the terms, which is basically the similarity and meaning between those terms. I'm a professor at this university, and I conduct research in psychology and artificial intelligence. I'm also a teacher. I teach undergraduate students and I teach graduate students, and this is the way that I could be teaching the courses. Taking a piece of paper and basically reading from that paper, delivering information um, to you. And funnily enough, this is the way most universities teach their students. Large lecture halls where university professors teach their students. The question is, what is effective teaching? And um, researchers have investigated this question for many, many decades, and they don't really have a good answer to this question. That's kind of bothersome. So we're teaching in a way, and we actually don't really know whether that's the most effective way. One thing we do know is what does not work. And in fact, there are studies that have shown that uh, an average student learns from an average lecture about 15%. You heard that right. One five, 15 percent of the 90 minutes lecture. So university professors give a lecture for 90 minutes, students remember 15 percent, and a week later, if you apply a memory function, hardly anything is left. But at least afterwards, there's the textbook. Students go home, get their homework, read from the textbook, and um, learn at least a little bit. So you would think. Well, there's one study from colleagues of mine that have compared various conditions. They looked at human tutoring. So you have a human tutor that interacts with a student on a face-to-face -face basis. There's a computer tutor that interacts with students. And then there were two control conditions. In one condition, students just learned, read a textbook for 90 minutes. And there was a, a, a baseline, a no condition. Students were just sitting there for 90 minutes doing absolutely nothing. And the results show that when it came to learning gains, human tutoring worked best. Not a surprise. So you have one-to-one -one teaching where, student, where a tutor asks the students particular questions and the student answers that yielded the highest learning gains. The computer tutor did quite well. So you have sort of online classroom sessions, but at least they were interactive. And students learned quite a bit from there, too. I want to focus on the other two conditions, the nothing condition and the textbook condition. Because it showed that in the nothing condition, learning gains were actually higher than in the textbook condition. Even worse, in the textbook condition, there was negative learning. Students learned less after sitting there with a textbook for 90 minutes than doing absolutely nothing. So this is what we do at universities. We teach classes. We have university lecturers giving information to students in the hope that that information will stick. Well, 15% does. And I should add to that also the jokes, but only the jokes that are unrelated to the content of the lectures. <laughs> and then we ask them to read a textbook and we know that yields negative learning gains. So the question really is, why does it not work? Well, it's pretty clear. Information delivery doesn't work. There's no class participation, and we know that that doesn't work. There's little coher coherence within courses and between courses, so students even jump from one course to another, and there's no relation in the content whatsoever. And finally, there's no relation between the lectures and the real world. This is a kind of sad conclusion. Our educational system seems to fail. So is there anything that does work? Well, I've always been wondering why it is that children, adolescents, adults, like playing computer games. They can do that for 24 hours in a row. They have no problem doing that. They're absorbed in a computer game. And yet, when you ask them to spend half an hour of homework, they hate it. If you ask them to go to a lecture for 90 minutes, they hate it. So why is that? Well, perhaps because diversity and dynamics helps. Perhaps a change in content, a change in environment helps. And have a dynamic environment helps. Curiosity and imagination helps. Making students curious has shown that it yields learning gains. Have them imagine things helps. Creativity helps. And finally, interactivity and feedback helps. 
rather than information delivery, also getting the feedback and sort of adapting to that feedback. We know that that helps. And perhaps that suggests why you are here today. You have the diversity and the dynamics, there's curiosity and imagination, there's cu creativity presented to you, and there's interactivity and feedback. Perhaps that's the right way of teaching our students. And we know this from the educational literature as well. The educational psychologists have found that constructivist learning approaches seem to work best. Rather than just dumping information on students, in fact, present them with a problem and have them figure it out. Um, present them with a project and have them come up with a solution to the problems defined in that project. Or have inquiry-based inquiry learning. So basically have students use their creativity and imagination. We know that that helps, and yet we don't do it. Now, every academic year, when I talk to my colleagues, we tell each other, the students get younger and younger these days. And I think it says more about us than about the students. We also quickly add to that that the students seem to be less and less interested in all the fascinating stuff that we have to tell them. Because what we tell them is absolutely fascinating, but those students don't seem to get it. So perhaps the question it, uh, lies in, who is to blame? Perhaps it's not the students. Perhaps it's the educational system. Perhaps those students aren't quite indifferent. And they would have, we would have an excuse as a university. We could say, well, this is the way we've been doing it for hundreds of years because there are no alternatives. This is the only way we can do it. We have a few university lectures, and they have to deliver information to students, and we can only hope that some of that information will stick. But recently, times have changed. There's technology. And we can actually use that technology in the classroom, but we hardly do it. We use PowerPoint presentations, usually basically putting textbook information on those PowerPoints in the hope that then information will stick, but we're not really using technology in any other way. And that's a pity, because we could be using virtual reality, augmented reality, as well as mixed reality in the classroom. So virtual reality is where you have those glasses on your head and you're presented with a virtual world, a strictly virtual world. There's nothing of the real world um, around you. You have mixed reality where you basically combine things. You have the virtual world around you, but you're using aspects of the real world. The table and the chair can be real, but the walls look, look very different. And then you have augmented reality where you're basically providing additional information on top of um, the real world. So for instance, I have my glasses on, I see you in addition to that, I know your age, your telephone number, your address, etc., etc. That information could be used in a classroom. And that's what we envisioned when we proposed the Duff Technology Lab, a virtual, augmented, and mixed reality lab. Because society is changing, and technology becomes ubiquitous. There's technology all around us, and students would like to experience that technology, right? And particularly if you want to understand society, you might have to um, implement the technology in the classroom. Also, this virtual and augmented reality lab provides us with an interdisciplinary opportunity. So this university has schools such as economics and management, social and behavioral sciences, humanities, law, as well as theology. And this interdisciplinary lab provides students with a unique opportunity to work together, students from different schools. It allows researchers to work um, together. And it provides a dynamic teaching and research environment. Not the case where you have a classroom environment and you throw information at the student. Instead, students are interacting with the environment. And finally, it provides us with new ideas and technology. I'm convinced that um, new ideas within technology don't come from within the technology. I think they come from perspectives on the technology. And this university, particularly together with, for instance, technical universities, is uniquely placed to make that progress. So what we have in mind is, um, and it's going to open soon, what we have in mind is a virtual and augmented reality lab where, for instance, you present um, the walls of a court on the rooms in a classroom, and students would have the experience that they're actually sitting in a courtroom. So law students are now going to be educated in uh, the environment they're soon going to work in. Or you have students working in economics. They now can experience the boardroom that they will soon be working in and actually interact with that environment. So it's not just a presentation on the wall, but interact with the environment, being dynamically involved in the learning environment, um, in the material they're supposed to learn. 
Um, or imagine a medical psychology student who wants to interact in a hospital environment. In the real world, that gets kind of hard. This provides us with a unique environment to train them for the work workplace in order to understand um, society. So and this is for those teachers and students out there. Let's initiate to innovate. Thank you.